So good afternoon. We'll get started. So on this uh, <coughs> uh, cold afternoon, uh, we have a, a very hot topic. Uh, of course, for we New Englanders, this is not a cold afternoon. This is what invigorates. So I hope you feel in invigorated. So uh, Jeff, could you switch on the slide for me? Okay, so <clears throat> somebody uh, called me up and said, what's this Borger effect? I'm looking it up on the uh, internet and I don't find anything. Well, that's because it's uh, an invention <laughs> of mine. You know what the Borger effect is? The, the Borgers, of course, were the 15th century Italian family that raised hell and in part by poisoning people and they came up with the astounding observation that two poisons are better than one. So, ergo, the Borga effect. Uh, these three uh, diseases, hepatitis B, C, and HIV AIDS, have a great deal in common uh, and certain things that separate them. But in terms of human illness and global problems, it's not out of line to use the familiar three-ring uh, anagram, and there are areas where each one overlaps with the other, and even in the center where all three occur. And this combination of multiple diseases, multiple viral diseases, two or three in whatever combination, uh, are posing enormous uh, health problems all around the world, uh, here and some more so in other countries. And they focus strongly on uh, how does this overlap occur? What are the consequences? How does one viral infection influence the course of another? And where do we stand in terms of dealing with this not uncommon problem as you will hear? So we're very fortunate to have two uh, outstanding investigators uh, here at uh, NIH. Uh, our first speaker, there are many investigators, but we have two who are here today with us. Our first uh, speaker is going to be uh, Shima uh, Cotillo, who's in uh, NIAID. Uh, uh, he received his medical degree in India and a PhD in Canada trained in Brown and then came to the NIH in an infectious disease fellowship in 2003. And it's very common when people come here and find this exciting environment, they stay. And he has developed a very exciting uh, career uh, dealing with collaborating and dealing with uh, patients on one hand and immunologic problems primarily uh, uh, concerned with hepatitis C for the main part. And our second speaker uh, is Quan Tejuan John, uh, who received his medical degree and PhD from Hopkins and has been a tenured professor here for uh, more than two decades. And his laboratory has uh, been in the leading role of studying the molecular mechanisms of HIV and HTLV-1. Uh, retroviruses having some, some relationship uh, to one another. Uh, now, the way we've divided this, uh, the program is that we're very fortunate that a patient has been kind enough to come uh, who has one of these combinations, and it's going to explain a bit about her disease. So perhaps, uh, Shima, if you would like to interview your patient. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Yes. Um, so demystifying any medicine starts with someone who has these diseases. And we're very thankful for Mrs. Brown, Diana Brown, to be able to hear and just talk us about, talk us through how she felt when the diagnosis, when she was diagnosed with these diseases and how she was able to deal with it and how her relationship with the, um, the, her um, herself, her family, as well as in, um, get through her very, very difficult treatment. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon. I'm very, very, very grateful and glad. Oh, very grateful and glad to be here. Um, yes, my name is Diana Brown. I was um, diagnosed um, HIV positive while I was pregnant in 1990. Um, and um, yeah, I was diagnosed HIV positive in 1990. And um, so how are we going to do this? You going to ask questions or I'm just going to go on? Okay, just go on. Um, anyway, so by the time I was diagnosed, my, um, my um, T cells was like 267 and my viral load was like up in the hundreds of thousands, like 600 or something thousand, something like that. But anyway, um, and um, I was blessed to um, get on medicine and, um, and as the years went by, um, it finally became undetectable. So right now, as far as the um, HIV medicine, I'm on um, um, a cocktail of um, Isentris, um, Norvir, um, um, Epsicom, and Epsicom, and that's what I take. Um, I take the Epsicom and the Norvir and the Isentris in the morning, and then in the evening, I only have to take the Isentris. Um, also, I'm on um, gabapentin because of the HIV. Um, I have neuropathy. So I also take um, gabapentin for that three times a day. But as far as, um, and so then everything was going okay, but it was always, my doctors was always reminding me, as soon as we get the HIV and get you to the point where you're strong enough and the HIV is, you know, staying undetectable for a good length of time, then we got to start dealing with the um, hepatitis C. So it was always in the back of my mind, when is this going to come? When is this going to come? So finally, um, what happened was um, my side, my right side started hurting, bothering me a lot. And um, when I went to one of my um, appointments, I told my doctor about it. And um, just so happened, as God would have it, Carmen, who um, apparently comes out to do um, hospitals and stuff and um, um, look for anybody that may want to become um, be a part of the research here. So um, she took my name and um, they gave me a call and that was in um, 2010. So I started coming here in June and that was me. So from June, you know, they started telling me about um, what would what their side effects would be about the medicine and everything to make sure I would be prepared and ready if I wanted to deal with that. Um, of course, I was ready. Um, you know, it's nothing like every day knowing that you have something that eventually, if it's not taken care of, is going to take its toll. So, of course, I was ready. And so I started taking the, um, the um, um, I never really um, ever got this name right, but what is it called? The interferon. <laughs> so I started taking the shot of interferon and um, um, three ribavirins in the morning and three at night. So as far as the side effects, everything they was telling me, I was like, God is good because I'm not feeling nothing for the for the first three months. And I had to come every two weeks in the beginning. And every time I came, I was just so happy and smiling. They was like, oh, you're doing good. I said, yeah, girl, God is good, you know. But anyway, just to put a little humor into it. But, <laughs> but anyway, eventually, after about three months, uh, Oh, I started feeling really, you know, depressed, and um, I just, and I was trying to go to school at the same time, too, and I was like, um, I just didn't start, I started losing my energy and my drive, and then the next thing I know, I was crying to um, um, Mr. Kwan about, I thought I was losing my hair, um, it, it just, it, you know, it just seemed like so fast. Everything went from happy, I'm glad I'm on this, and it's not bothering me, to all of a sudden it felt like, am I going to be able to finish this? But um, I say that for me, it was just good nurses, um, just good environment that just really kept me when some days I just wanted to say I can't do it anymore. Um, I don't want to get teary-eyed on y'all because some days it would be like that. But um, just a good environment and um, just 
and just believing that this door wouldn't have been open for me if it wasn't meant to come out in my favor. So anyway, y'all, to get past the teary out and everything, I just want to say, when they finally told me and started explaining to me how fast mine was dropping, my arm, because, oh, yeah, I didn't tell you, my viral load was like three million something, right? Can you imagine how scary that is? It, that sounds like it's, if it just got to, for me, if it got down to a million, I thought it would add five more years to my life. So that was good enough for me. But I'm just saying, um, you know, and just over the time, just showing me how it was dropping. And then I'll never forget when one day they said, it's down to 70,000. And I just... Um, you know, that's kudos to y'all researchers and I don't know what y'all do behind them walls and in them little cubicles or however y'all work, but I just thank you. Um, anyway, it went down to 70000 and then finally, um, I think it was Mr. Kwan or somebody that told me it was seventy, and that was good and it was undetectable. So I am one happy sister here today. I'm Glad to be able to say that um, my last shot was in August of 2000. Um, I went. I started August. Oh, 2011 was my last shot. I started August 2010, and I had my last shot in August of 2011. And I'm right now today. After all this time, I'm still undetectable. So. Um, the research has done a fantastic job for me, and is that it, sir? Um, is that all? <laughs> okay. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Any questions for Ms. Brown? Yes. Yeah. I just uh, described the hepatitis C. The hepatitis C. How you felt about that, and but. Back in 2003, HIV was still a pretty scary diagnosis to get. And I was wondering how you felt emotionally when you first heard about that diagnosis and then how you handled that treatment. OK, um, I'm a very honest person. In the beginning, I ran. Um, of course, in 1990, it was like, it was no cure. Um, um, it was no cure or anything, so I ran, and I hid behind medicating myself. Um, I was a drug user. Um, my choice of drug was um, heroin and um, cocaine. And I would say from 1990, when I first found out, until 98, um, I really didn't take any medicine. I, I just ran. And then finally in um, 1998, um, that's what was a while back. So I can't re really remember what kind of medicine that they had started me on, but I was living in Louisiana then. Um, so um, that's when I started feeling a, a little hope that um, let me continue on the medicine and leave the drugs alone. And that was in 1998. It didn't last very long, so I went back to using drugs and not taking my medicine. So when I really started um, taking my medicine in 2004, I think is when I really got into leaving the drugs alone and just concentrating on the medicine. Um, and then I started hearing my numbers come down. And, and then when they would like kind of like peak back up a little bit, and then they would take something away and add something else, um, and then it would go back down. So ever since then, I have been hopeful with the HIV medicine. Um, I'm not depressed about it anymore because um, they have ways, they know the knowledge is so much better now that if one medicine, if your body, if my body starts getting too immune to it and it's not working anymore, they take it away and add something else. And my numbers just uh, consistently saying, staying um, undetectable. But in the beginning, it was dreadful for me. I, you know, I just didn't have any hope. I didn't see any, 
anything as far as no cure and uh, not even being able. I just, my whole dread was getting sick. I didn't mind. I mean, I'm not going to say I didn't mind having the HIV. But by me not having any effects from it by then, um, my whole terror was of when I seen people that were sick. I didn't want to get to that part. So that's why I didn't even want to waste my time on the medicine. I just chose to um, hopefully go away some kind of way by a drug overdose or something. But I finally got past that. Hi, um, I was interested, I heard that you said that you had to um, wait a period of time to get your HIV under control before you started the HCV treatment. So what kind of threshold did you have to reach before you could start the hepatitis C treatment? Um, because of my background of, um, uh, like when I, like I said, when I didn't see any hope or, or anything, because of my background of not consistently keeping my appointments, consistently so the doctors could see where I'm, where I was at and everything. Um, I think they took about two years of um, just watching me and um, making sure that it stayed um, undetectable, to and and watching me to see if I was gonna have enough of um, my mindset and physically to be able to handle the injections. So it was about two years. Thank you so much, Ms. Okay. Thank So thank you, thank you for the audience, and uh, we will start our scientific discussion on how hepatitis C treatment has evolved over the past, and how hepatitis C and HIV interact. Um, the objectives for today is to just to give you an overview of the recent advances that happened in the natural history, pathogenesis, and the current management strategies for hepatitis C virus infection. In, in the end, we'll also talk about the newly emerging, more exciting type of directly acting antiviral agents that is going to revolutionize the way we treat hepatitis C. Um, just for a disclosure, we'll be talking about some of the drugs, and I will mention that as we go by are not FDA approved, so these are investigational drugs, and many of these things are being studied right now, so we really do not know exactly what, they will, what role they will play in the eventual treatment paradigm of hepatitis C. Uh, there are a variety of hepatitis C viruses that have been discussed at demystifying medicine multiple times. The most of them are listed in this, in this um, as you can see, they are not related genetically. They are very diverse type of viruses. And the diseases they actually lead to are, most of them lead to an acute syndrome where you either have a high degree of mortality or, or they actually have a, a chronic disease. Of the, of the most important viruses that lead to chronic infections are hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Over the course of the time, they're responsible for most of the chronic hepatitis that we see in this country. And the discovery of hepatitis C, again, you can see Dr. Alter there. Uh, you can see the fem this, is the, this is the first paper that described the non-A, non-B hepatitis C. As you can see, some of the authors here, some people are here in the audience, and some people are working in this building, uh, were made uh, important steps in identifying hepatitis C as a new virus that is transmitted at that time via transfusion and making adequate measures so that transfusion supply of the hepatitis viruses have been de on decline. The natural history of hepatitis C is um, pretty, pretty much well studied and, and, and we know quite a bit about it. If you get an acute hepatitis, if at all you get it, most of the time you're completely asymptomatic. Only a very small fraction of people will actually know that they have hepatitis C. As Mrs. Brown just mentioned that People don't even know unless you get checked out, either a part of a pregnancy screening or a part of a regular doctor's visit, and they will see that you are actually have some abnormalities in your lab, and then you check for it. You really don't know. 85% of the people who get infected with hepatitis C will become chronically infected. These people, have, you don't have a good immune system to get rid of hepatitis C by itself. Over the course of Lyme, over a long period of time, over the course of 20 to 30 years, quite variable from individual to individual, people will develop into a lot of scarring of the liver and cirrhosis of the liver. 
Once you develop cirrhosis, then you have a liver failure pretty much in the next few years, or you could develop liver cancer. Eventually, both of these pathways lead to death unless you can get a liver transplantation, which is very difficult in this country. But the changing pattern of hepatitis C, one of the good things we have done since the discovery of hepatitis C is to be able to shut down the transmissibility of hepatitis C by awareness of people who use, uh, who get by intravenous drug use or by cleaning up our transfusion, blood transfusion systems and um, blood related product systems. So we have practically shut down new infections. As you can see, the new infections have, have relatively peaked already in 10 years ago. But you can see that the, if you don't do anything about the hepatitis C epidemic, it is going to have a big impact on patients who are having liver failure in the next 10 years or so. So but from this point of time to here, we have to be able to intervene and make sure that hepatitis C epidemic doesn't really progress the way it's supposed to. If it does that, we are going to have a bigger problem, a public health problem in our hands. Hepatitis C is a relatively common problem. If you're going to talk about HIV and hepatitis C, one of the things we can do, there are about one million li people living in the United States with HIV infection. It is estimated that anywhere between four to five million people are living with the chronic hepatitis C, which is about five times more than HIV. The awareness of hepatitis C is actually not as, um, at the same part as HIV. People are more aware of HIV than hepatitis C. Even among the patients who infected with HIV, we can see that about one-third of all patients are also infected with also infected with H hepatitis C. This is mainly because the mode of transmission of acquiring HIV is quite similar to hepatitis C. As shown in the right side of the graph, if you acquire HIV by intravenous drug use, you're most likely to be co-infected with HIV, hep hepatitis C as well. So you get both viruses, and that's the big uh, population that we were talking about, mainly in the inner city populations in the United States, people have both viruses because they have a past drug abuse history. So what happens when you have both HIV infection and hepatitis C? This is the Borgia effect that Dr. Arias was talking about. This study was the first study that demonstrated that HIV adversely affects the natural history of hepatitis C infection. The study was performed in France by Yus Benemo and his colleagues. He took a group of people who had only hepatitis C, and he also looked at a group of people who have HIV and hepatitis C. And they did perform serial liver biopsies and looked at the liver and see how the progression of the hepatitis C fi liver fibrosis is happening. As so you can see, in this y-axis is the way we score the liver biopsy. Sero means no scarring and four means cirrhotic. That means and most of the liver is scarred. You can see that the red line representing HIV infected patients are always, uh, at every given time point, have a higher liver biopsy scarring score, indicating that HIV adversely affects hepatitis C infection. This study was performed in 1999 where most people with HIV infected patients were not treated for the HIV infection. If you treat HIV infection, it may not reflect this way, but we don't really know exactly uh, that data is because that data is not available. One of the good things that we've done, as you heard Mrs. Brown speaking over and over again, in 1990, having HIV, it was kind of like a death sentence because there was no particular treatment available for that. There were only one or two medications available. You hear all these horror stories of people actually you know, having plummeting their CD4 counts and having all these complications. It was a very different scenario. One of the good things that we have done is to discover different targets for HIV and treat HIV quite successfully. We know that the AIDS-related mortality in this patient population who are infected with HIV is significantly reduced. However, as the aging patient population is now aging, we are going to see a lot more complications that you'd see that you never saw in the HIV-infected patients before, such as cardiac complications, new cancers, and common cancers. But the one that tops the list is mortality associated with liver disease. So people wanted to take care of HIV in the early 90s because people, want, that was a major issue. But now the HIV is under control. We know that liver disease becomes a prominent problem, clearly illustrated by what she mentioned, that for, once you tackle HIV, hepatitis C becomes a major problem. So hepatitis C is the main, main cause in the United States that liver-related mortality is associated with the disease. So what is hepatitis C is quite different from other chronic infections. One of the things that makes it different are, is clearly shown in this graph, especially the last three. So you have a very prominent patient population of hepatitis C, and the genome is RNA very similar to HIV, and it mutates at very high rates within turnover in the, in the, in the body is very high. 
and there are multiple drug targets available, but what makes it different is that it doesn't really have the genetic archive mutations that HIV has. And we're going to talk about that in the second half of the presentation, how HIV is quite, quite unique, and the eradication of HIV from individual becomes very challenging. In the head of hepatitis C, it does not, the genome is an RNA, it replicates in the, in the cytoplasm, it does not integrate into the D nucleus of the DNA, so in theoretically you can actually eradicate hepatitis C infection without killing the cell. That is, there is proof of principle for that. In the early studies using interferon, we were able to do that, and you can actually clear hepatitis C without killing the cell. So there is a cure as a principle was effective, which made it very different for a hepatitis C. Again, I mentioned before, since the discovery by Dr. Alter of hepatitis C, over the course of the time, several significant advances have happened. One of the time was, J. Hofnagel from NIDDK has demonstrated with Adrian DiBoscelli that interferon alpha 2b is a quite good treatment paradigm for hepatitis C. Although those days were standard interferon, it was an injection has to be given every day. It was, as Mrs. Brown mentioned, it has a lot of side effect. It was the first study that demonstrated that by proof of principle that you can actually eradicate this virus. It's a disease that if you untreat it, will invariably progress to liver cirrhosis and death. So we, that's a proof of principle was there, that interferon can be used to treat patients um, to cure hepatitis C. As over the course of time, there are several advances that happen, addition of ribavirin, pegylation of interferon that enable us to use this for a week, um, in a weekly injection rather than daily injection, and last year, addition of the protease inhibitors, which is the first act directly acting antiviral agent for the treatment of hepatitis C. The reason why we treat hepatitis C is for eradication of hepatitis C. Before, a few years ago, we used to think that we could eradicate hepatitis C. Even if we cannot eradicate hepatitis C, we may be able to achieve some of these other outcomes like arrest the progression of the liver disease and prevent some of the complications associated with rapid progression of liver disease such as the decompensation or occurrence of liver cancer and death. However, there are several studies done, some of the study one done by NIDDK, um, um, Hall C study and some other studies or co-pilot studies clearly demonstrated that if we cannot eradicate the hepatitis C virus, there is no sustained improvement in the liver function. So our goal has always has to be to eliminate hepatitis C. So the <coughs> thought process is quite clear. We have to be able to eradicate hepatitis C. It's not long-term suppression like we do for hepatitis B or HIV infection. Why do we do that? The big problem is that, as I said, that hepatitis C will be a big public health problem in the United States. If you look at the state that we are not treating enough patients with a treatment regimen that is able to cure a lot of people. At this rate, we are not going to have a major impact on reducing the liver diseases, morbidity, and mortality in this country. So those are the first three figures. Even if you have a, a great regimen right now, which is able to cure about 80% of the people, we really won't make an impact because we are not treating a lot of people. We are only treating a handful of people. But if you have a regimen that's pretty good, and we are treating a large number of patients who are infected with hepatitis C, gradually we are going to make a big impact. So we don't really have this problem by 10 years from now. We have to deal with a lot of patients who have hepatitis C and progressive liver disease. The one stumbling block for achieving this is the side effect profile of the drugs that we use to treat that. If the side effect profile of the drugs are quite easy to take and they don't have a lot of side effects, a lot of physicians would have been treating hepatitis C than used to at this particular rate. So we have to have better drugs to treat that. When we look at the cure rates of hepatitis C, the treatment regimen used to be interferon, a pegylated interferon and ribavirin. So the response rate for a pegylated interferon ribavirin is about 50%. If you look at genotype 1, which is the type of the mutated strain that is usually seen in the United States, we have much less response rate. It's about 40%. Then if you look at African Americans with infected with HIV, that's about 20%. If you look at HIV-infected patients, the response rate for this particular regimen is close to 20%. So these are not very effective treatment. So in the last couple of years, we've been started using the HCV protease inhibitor for the treatment of hepatitis C. You can see that hepatitis this actually doubles the response rate in genotype 1, from 40% to close to like 70 to 80%. <coughs> Same is true for African Americans. It goes up from to close to 50% in African Americans. And also, a similar effect is expected in the studies were completed for HIV hepatitis C infected patients. Although the results are much better with the addition of protease inhibitor, you have more toxicities, and it is no way close to the numbers we were talking before. It's not close to the 80% or 90% response rate. 
So the current status is that if you have genotype 2, which is the easy to treat hepatitis C, you would only need six months of treatment with interferon and ribavirin. But if you really have a very good response, a rapid response on hepatitis C going undetectable by week four, then you can shorten that duration to three months. So three months is a more acceptable treatment for genotype 2. However, if you have genotype 1, then the treatment response rate is, six, uh, is usually one year. If you have a rapid response rate, rapid response rate of hepatitis C is have by undetectable level of hepatitis C by um, week four, then you, respond, you can treat these people for half of the time, which is about um, six months duration. However, if you don't have a rapid response, it, then your treatment duration for now is 72 weeks. This is a range, 72 weeks of interferon with ribavirin uh, is not an acceptable type. People cannot really take it for that much long. Although there are several people who have taken these, this becomes one of the Im major impediments in treating patients with hepatitis C. For HIV infected patients, we really don't have a lot of these data from clinical trials, so we assume usually treat patients for one year. There are several response rates when you do. You, it's not like you respond fine and you achieve cure or you don't. So if you treat someone with hepatitis C with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, there are about six different types of responses you can see. One is incomplete treatment. A lot of people drop out within the first few weeks. You will not have any information how they respond to the data. Other group of patients who have no response whatsoever, they will have really a, what you could define as a null response. We will come back to that in a second. You have partial response, that means they actually respond initially, but they never go to the levels of undetectability. It is also the people, group of people who require longer duration of treatment. Then you have the most, the worst response, which has, I'm concerned, is that they respond really well. They become undetectable on treatment, but at the end of one year when you stop treatment, the relapse is the most disheartening thing the patient has to, to figure out when you already have done, suffered all through the side effects, and then at the end of the day, when you stop treatment, the virus comes back. You always have breakthroughs of infection while on treatment. And finally, you have what you call what's a desirable response is a sustained virologic response. You stop treatment, and six months later, you have no detectability of the response. There are several factors that influence how a patient responds because the treatment is an immune-based treatment. Your body has to help hep to clear hepatitis C. For interferon-based treatment, we have a host of factors that are responsible, um, genetic factors responsible. We'll touch base in a second. There are viral genetics and viral genotype play an important role in determining response rate. As well as there are several clinical and epidemiological factors like which race and ethnicity you are, how old are you, all those things play a major role in respond, how, how you, a person responds to this treatment. So the factors that are associated with poor outcome for interferon-based treatment are the viral factors, mainly the genotype, <coughs> high viral load, highly diverse hepatitis C, and the several of the host factors I mentioned, age, African-American race, the different genetic SNPs of interferon lambda, we'll touch base in a second, um, consuming alcohol while you receive treatment, advanced liver disease, having HIV co-infection. For HIV co-infected patients, have a low CD4 count, do not use ribavirin, and previous interferon user, all bad prognostic factors associated with the bad response for hepatitis C with the interferon treatment. So, if you just follow this, so this is the rate of sustained virological response on the y-axis. If you treat glo globally, the people with the most favorable outcome with the interferon-based treatment are East Asians, followed by Caucasian in, in Europe, followed by Caucasians in America, followed by, in the, at the end, the worst response is African-American. The distribution of this particular SNP, the inter interleukin 28b, which is an interferon lambda SNP, was exactly identical. This, this favorable allele is seen mainly the highest frequency in East Asians and the lowest frequency in African Americans. So there is a causal relationship, although we do not really know exactly how the SNP biologically influences the response to interferon at this time. So why do we talk about the sustained virologic response? How is it anyway different from long-term suppression for HIV or other diseases? Studies have shown that once you achieve a sustained response, that means if you have no detectable HCV in the serum <coughs> after treatment, then that's pretty sustained. 
No, 99% of those people to remain like that years later, which is good. And if you do that, if you have a bad consistent, then, then your liver gets, actually will get better. The less fibrosis, fibrosis is, we know that is a reversible condition. You can have less fibrosis over the course of time and less risk for developing uh, hepatocellular carcinomas and other causes associated with liver failure. So this is a pretty good standard that we have accomplished. We want to be able to make sure that people achieve sustained response and then you can make sure that these people have less risk of dying of liver disease. However, <coughs> we talked about we want to make a simplified regimen and one of the advantages is that the hepatitis C life cycle has multiple targets. There are targets like it's the proteases, the NS3, non-structural S3, S3, 4 pro is an HCB protease. It's a good target for blocking hepatitis C replication. You have NS5A, which uh, allows with, uh, it's the main forms the main replication complex of the membranous web formation. It is also good um, blockers available that should be able to block hepatitis C replication. And you have the main class, the NS5B polymerase inhibitors, which are uh, the main inhibitors of the RNA polymerase enzyme. So the targets are available for all these enzymes, and targets have synergistic effect. So potentially, you could develop strategies that actually block hepatitis C at different stages of the life cycle and make a bigger impact. So the drug classes you hear are basically the NS3, NS4 protease inhibitors, which are already approved. There are two of them are already approved. They have great drugs. They block hepatitis C very well. However, they have a low genetic barrier of resistance. If you give them alone, hepatitis C become resistant very quickly. Similarly, it's the case for the non-nucleotide analogs as well as for NS5A inhibitors. All these drugs are <coughs> great. They have great potency in blocking hepatitis C, but low threshold for developing resistance. So they have to be combined. The best class of drug, which will be the backbone of, for the treatment of hepatitis C, if all the studies are done, and phase three studies are done, would be this blue graph over here is a nucleotide inhibitor. Nucleotide inhibitors are a high genetic barrier, they're very potent drug, they're well tolerated drugs so far, and they would, there is no virological breakthroughs that we have seen so far with these particular drugs. So it's good, but, but it's, and you can give them alone, and there, there is no resistance so far. They're a very potent drug. They can be used as monotherapy, although that may not happen in, the, in real life. They're very potent um, drugs in the class. So that is the, one of the major um, breakthroughs that we have. Several categories of drugs available now are being studied for uh, simplifying the treatment for hepatitis C. There was huge debate that we know that interferon as is known to achieve sustained virological response. From an infectious disease point of view, if you have a chronic viral infection, we generally believe that we need the immune system to kick in at some point to be able to completely eradicate the particular virus. We really don't have a lot of examples in which you can just take a pill and you can suppress the virus, but you can get rid of, develop protective immunity in a large number of patients. We don't. So the, there was no proof of principle done that without interferon, you could do the same thing with hepatitis C. And this was studies were done. Some of these studies, I'll just go through them. Is that the first study was done, published that this, this study was done in two groups. This used four drugs in group B. And I'll go through group B first. They used pegylated interferon, ribavirin, and two directly acting agents, an NS5A inhibitor and a protease inhibitor for hepatitis C, and achieved almost 100% cure rate. And this is the cure rate over here. However, in the group A, they did not use interferon or ribavirin. They just used the two drugs alone. As you can see that 40% of the people were cured and that was sustained. So without using interferon, although it's not very high numbers, these two drugs, they were able to demonstrate that you can actually eradicate hepatitis C. Subsequently, there were two studies were published last week in the um, New England Journal of Medicine. One was an Abbott study, which looked at uh, Abbott drugs, which involved a protease inhibitor and a non-nucleoside analog, along with ribavirin. They treated patients for three months, and they looked at uh, how you can suppress hepatitis C viral load. And in two groups, the groups were never received any treatment for hepatitis C. The interferon naive, they were able to suppress hepatitis C viral load. And when you stop treatment, they, they were able to achieve sustained virologic response. So as proof of principle, you can use this kind of treatment, which does not rely on interferon, and utilize uh, virological suppression and achieve sustained virological response. However, the same thing is not true when previous patients have 
previously failed interferon. This is something that we really don't understand at this point of time because studies have been done very, very, only very few studies have been done. If you have been previously treated with interferon and not responded, then patients have a really relatively poor response. Most people actually break through. The response rate here is about 50% in the study compared to 100% in the previous study. Another study using the nucleotide drug, which I mentioned, which is the NS5B RNA polymerase inhibitor, they were also able to demonstra demonstrate that just by using this drug and riboberin, you can also get very good results. So this particular study randomized different groups of patients with genotype 2 and 3, as well as genotype 1, and they reported the results in the same New England Journal of Medicine article. It will be difficult to read, but I will highlight these points too. The first arms are they used different concentrations of interferon here for four weeks, eight weeks, or 12 weeks to treat patients. Here you used interferon without just riboberin, not interferon at all with this drug, and here was the drug alone. And as you can see, the response rate in the small number of samples is always 100%. So even but did not make any difference whether you added interferon or not. So again, proof of principle wise, you could treat genotype two and three patients um, with successfully without interferon, and those phase three studies are ongoing right now, which, will, which if they are um, viable, those studies will prove that this will be the norm for treating patients without interferon. However, for genotype one, which is the most commonest genotype that you see in the United States, there were, again, the two groups of patients who were naive to treatment and who patients who actually been previously treated and failed interferon treatment. The response rate you go here, great result for patients who are new to treatment, our not so great results for patients who were previously treated. The mechanism of the why previous treatment to interferon, how does it influence further treatment for new drugs is not clearly understood at this time. The great thing about using the new drugs is the adverse event profile. You know that interferon has a lot of adverse events, your immediate adverse events is the long-term adverse events that has neuropsychiatric complications. These drugs have none. It's a sh short period of time, you have most of these patients have relatively very low incidence of anemia and other hematological toxicities. So we don't see a lot of toxicities associated with the drugs so far, and if that holds good, it will be easier to treat patient population with that. In the last bit, I will just, in the last five minutes, we'll just talk about our program and how our program um, has developed um, participating in the new drug development and changing the therapeutics of hepatitis C. We all know that Washington, D.C. has a great um, um, incidence of HIV infection. It's estimated that about 3% of all patients in Washington, D.C. have a infected with HIV infection. It's all estimated that 2% of the Washington, D.C. patient population have hepatitis C. So it, NIH started the District of Columbia initiative three years ago. In the last three years, we have established four different sites where we have multiple clinics to provide standard of care for hepatitis C. We, will we are conducting different clinical trials at these centers where we are able to bring the state of the art treatment for hepatitis C to the Washington DC patient population, where we'll be able to link patients to care and be able to provide the state of the care. Our program has been extremely active in terms of you know, um, looking at interferon-based treatment as well as the new oral agents. You can see it gets staggered this year. All the blues are different protocols we've done um, over the course of the time as we're doing more and more because new studies are coming, uh, are much easier to do in terms of duration of treatment as well as uh, looking at different combinations and how they would work in a difficult to treat patient population. The last bit was a study design that we did, one of the interferon free study that we performed at a clinical center here was the first FDA approved genotype 1 study um, for interferon free regimen. We used standard, in, we did not use interferon at all. Because of the first study, we were asked to do a pilot study for part 1, where we used the GS7977 as a nucleotide inhibitor with riboberin for the first 10 patients. And once safety was established, we moved to part two, which is a randomized stage, to use the, the study drug with full dose riboberin or a study dose with about half dose riboberin. So this study was completed, and the early research suggests that there, there were very difficult to treat patient population. Compared to most of the studies that you've seen, these patients were genotype 1A. They were predominantly African-American. They have relatively high body mass index. 
They had the bad IL-28B genotype that predicted a poor response. They have very relatively very high hepatitis C viral RNA levels. And they also had about 25% of the second phase had advanced liver disease, which is another group of patients who are more difficult to treat. So this is what we thought the type of patients would require hepatitis C treatment when the drugs are approved. We want to be able to demonstrate that these drugs are actually effective in treating these patients. As you look at the study results, in the first treatment response, or 9 out of 10 patients achieved a sustained virologic response. It's a very effective treatment for this defective patient population. However, um, so this is 100% on the, if you take one patient dropped out in week three, if you take all the modified intensive treat, anyone who taken at least two, two months of treatment is pretty 100%, a very good response in the first part. In the second part in the randomization phase, where you look at, it is a very effective in suppressing patient. Almost all patients who took the drug were suppressed on antiviral load, but the sustained virological response was 72% on, in intention to treat, and 75% if you t include the patients who actually took the medications for more than two months. In the low dose ribavirin phase, you can see that that response rate dropped to about 56%, suggesting that ribavirin is an important piece of hepatitis C treatment paradigm at this point of time. We really do not know what ribavirin does, but this is going to be an important piece of the function moving forward. The remarkable thing is that when you have to look at the liver and see how the responses are in the liver, you can see this is a patient who underwent a liver biopsy before they went to treatment. For those of you who are not familiar with that, you can see this, this pinkish area represents the liver tissue, the hepatocytes, and the blues are the, the lymph lymphocyte infiltration of the liver, um, indicating the inflammatory response, host inflammatory response to hepatitis C. As you can see, the portal inflammation here, there's quite significant inflammation. After six months of treatment, you re-biopsy this patient. You can see the most of that purplish areas are gone. Lymphocytic infiltration, liver in the inflammation liver is significantly over. Over the course of the time when we follow these patients and re-biopsy them, we'll be able to see whether this lack of inflammation or subdued inflammation would translate into reversal of scarring, which is the most important clinical question we want to know after you get rid of hepatitis C. So from our District of Columbia program that we, um, we have started. Our plan of action is that a community-based program to go along with the NIAID hepatitis C treatment program in which we want to develop an interferon free st studies, which we developed already. At this point in time, we have seven pills a day to treat hepatitis C. We want to, along with that, we have established clinics in the community that are able to, to, to help us to direct the community-based program to tackle hepatitis C. Over the course of time, next week, we are starting an interferon and ribavirin free treatment, which is for a one pill once a day to treat hepatitis C, which will take about three months of treatment response rate. And at the same time, we started going to test patients in the District of Columbia. For hepatitis C, we'll have to be able to target how many people are there, how many people are these people are already linked to care, ready for treatment. Over the course of the next few months, we're going to start studies which will be looking probably at two to three months for treatment with hepatitis C. And when you do that, with one pill once a day to be able to treat two months, it will be very easy for us to be able to treat every single person in, in the District of Columbia. That's the long-term goal for the NIAD intramural program to along work with the District of Columbia initiative as well. So such enough, the, in conclusion, hepatitis C is a major cause of morbidity in this patient population. The burden of the disease significantly increase in the coming years unless we intervene. We know that the treatment is getting simpler and interferon free regimens are available. However, the durability of the response and rates of sustained virological response of such regimens are not clear at this point of time. And really appreciate the people who have worked in this program. It's a huge team effort, particularly with the leadership in AID, Dr. Lane, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Zoon. And we have a great support from the, our District Columbia staff and you know, several other people who actually have done a lot of pioneering work in hepatitis C at NIAD. Thank you. So I, I want to mention to you that all of the material that's presented in these sessions is uh, on the website, uh, all the PowerPoints. And we've also added uh, at least three or four 
uh, reference articles, including uh, at least one review article, particularly for those uh, who are not aficionados of the particular subject being discussed. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we have some time. If there are questions you would like to ask, please indicate. Yeah. Hi. Um, in the patients that are co-infected with HIV and HCV, do you ever see like cross-reactivity of the drugs used to treat HCV interacting with HIV replication or vice versa? So inter interferon is a very broad spectrum antiviral agent. That it works for both HCV and HIV. So generally, it's a one and a half log HIV drug. It's not as potent as you know give to a hepatitis C, but it also suppresses HIV quite well. Ribavirin, you know, is quite not clear. It may have a subtle benefit, but it do not have any direct effect. Most of the new drugs, they work specifically on a hepatitis E enzyme. So usually, it's not supposed to have any effect on HIV. Although a lot of HIV-infected patients have not taken these drugs, so we just don't know whether they have any adverse events by blocking some other enzyme. So, so let me ask you, uh, HIV infects primarily macrophages, uh, other kind of supporting cells, whereas hepatitis C virus uh, affects hepatocytes. Now, uh, is that the, the reason why two poisons are worse than one? Or are there other more intrinsic uh, properties of the viruses and their mechanisms of injury. You want to comment about that? So I'll, I'll comment on it. I don't, I don't think, you know, it's a very, very good question that how HIV affects hepatitis C because hepatitis C is generally considered to be not a cytopathic virus. That liver damage is because of your immune response against hepatitis C, and that's exactly why we think the problem is in HIV. That in, in certain circumstances, you know, HIV is not an, really an immunodeficiency disease, it's an immunodysregulated disease. That they really don't have an adequate enough immune response against pathogens, <laughs> because HIV as well as other, other infections. So then you are going to have, you know, seem somehow when you have uncontrolled HIV, you have more damage to the liver tissue. It probably induced by hepat hepatocytes, but that's what is re re usually see explanation for the damage. So it's mainly those immune activation and immune dysregulation effects, and not a direct HIV effect on the hepatocyte. Okay. Hi. So you mentioned that um, hepatitis C contraction is made one of the large drivers is injection drug use. So does treatment of hepatitis C, can it be given um, concurrently with things like buprenorphine to treat opioid addiction? That's a really good question. I think people, those studies were not done initially, but now it's pretty much standard. One of the, one of the first drugs that we do drug-drug interaction with HCV drug is methadone and buprenorphine. So most of these studies include once you have that drug and drug interaction, we include those people. And there are good data to suggest that if you're in a very good drug program, buprenorphine or methadone, people do equally well if you don't, you know, like people who have no drug abuse history. So it's very good data. And you know, the FDA and other people are really inclined to look at these patients who are already hooked up. We want to make sure that they are actually not actively using, but they are in a good program. They definitely do very well. That is not an exclusion criteria. Okay, well, there will be time after the next speaker. I forgot to mention that uh, K.T. Wong is also the uh, editor of uh, the journal Retrovirology and associate editor of Cancer Research and has published extensively in the field of HIV. So, K.T., thank you. Thank you. Is the microphone working? It's okay. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually uh, pinch hitting because uh, Wynn originally uh, wanted uh, John Coffin to give this lecture. And, you know, if John were here to give the lecture, I'm sure John would hit a home run. So I'm only here for the purposes of, you know, when the manager brings in the pinch hitter, he just wants to move the runner up the next base. So I'm here just to give you a bunt single, okay? so. 
don't necessarily be terribly disappointed, but, <clears throat> but that, was, that was really uh, my task at hand. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I've been at the NIH now for 25 years. And about 11 years ago, I started seeing these flags, you know, uh, posted on, on the entryways about uh, demystifying medicine. And I can tell you, I was totally mystified what this thing was all about. <clears throat> so, so uh, I know there are a lot of very mystifying diseases, but I think actually in 2013, which is what we are now, HIV is probably one of the less mystifying diseases. I mean, I think most of you sitting in this room have heard HIV you know, talked about in various settings, certainly in the lay media, in magazines, you know, in any sort of you know, a various and sundry discussion. So, so I would argue that perhaps it's not so mystifying. And so probably just for me to hit a bunt single would be enough to, to sort of uh, rise to the task of talking about <coughs> HIV. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how HIV first started. Some of you uh, may know that story. Uh, where the current situation is when we think about HIV. Uh, and as uh, uh, Ms. Brown uh, you know, very aptly illustrates uh, for us, we have come a long way. I mean, today, I think as long as we have access to medicine, uh, uh, outcomes like what Ms. Brown is, uh, is having is the rule rather than the exception. Okay? So, so the progress in terms of uh, treatment and in terms of what we know in terms of the fundamental virology of HIV is, I think, second to none in terms of any viral diseases. Uh, you know, some of the viral diseases that we use, uh, vaccine approaches, are obviously you know, even better. But in terms of treatment, drug treatment, and understanding fundamental biological mechanisms, HIV present day is probably one of the most advanced viral systems uh, that we know. And then I would just allude to a little bit about what we might want to look forward to uh, going down the road uh, in terms of the future. So the whole story for HIV and AIDS really began with this mortality and morbidity weekly review, which was uh, sort of uh, one of these newsprints uh, that was put out weekly by the CDC uh, back in 1981. And so, this was really sort of the sentinel call that said, hey, we may have a problem. Because there's a clustering back in June of 1981, there was a clustering of cases of uh, 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 infections that were rare and unexpected. And nobody really knew what was going on. But it was suspected that something new was on the horizon. And I remember I was uh, still in uh, graduate school doing my uh, MD, PhD at Hopkins at that time. And in fact, in two years later, in 1983, when this paper was published, I was working in my, on my PhD uh, looking at uh, studying herpes viruses. Uh, in 83 at Johns Hopkins. And this paper was published um, reporting the detection of viral particles in AIDS patients. And most of us looked at this list of individuals and said, well, who are these people? Surely they must be wrong. Because at that time, uh, I don't know if Wynn remembers this, but, uh, and I don't know whether Cheyenne remembers this or not, but. Back then, there were a number of papers published linking herpes virus and you know, virus X and virus Y and so on with you know, isolating them from AIDS patients and suggesting that they may be the causal uh, link between, uh, between the virus and the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So, so this particular paper uh, turned out to be correct, although at the time when it first came out, it was viewed with some skepticism. And then there was also a series of paper that was published from uh, Bob Gallo's lab, uh, which uh, very much contributed to establishing the causal link 
between HIV infection and the manifestation of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Uh, Bob had named it HTLV-3 because Bob had discovered HTLV-1, which is also a virus that I work on, which I actually think is a much more mystifying virus than HIV today. So these two groups, I think, were really instrumental in terms of discovering the virus and establishing the link between the virus and the disease. So the French turned out to be right. This was the electoral micrograph that was published in a science paper. These are, in fact, the lentiviral virions, and they are indeed the culprit that leads to the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So whenever you see a new disease pop up on the horizon, you have to ask yourself, why? And how did it come about, right? I mean, you know, <clears throat> somewhere there must be an origin of this particular disease. And we think that the origin of this particular disease is basically a trans-species uh, jump. And likely occurred in Africa because there is the consumption and there is a popularity of bushmeat, basically um, non-human primates being captured and uh, butchered and, uh, uh, and uh, sort of sold in the open air marketplace and, and individuals being exposed uh, to blood uh, from these, uh, these bushmeat. And potentially, that is how HIV, HDLV, and probably human, uh, human foamy viruses are all transmitted. And so we think that is likely the mechanistic jump between, uh, between uh, a virus that originated in non-human primates, monkeys, uh, and jumping probably uh, several decades be before the 1980s into the human pool and ultimately manifesting as disease and being, di being diagnosed as AIDS and then the virus being isolated. And in fact, that is more than just a guess because if you look phylogenetically, now that we can look at all the genetic fingerprints of all the different viruses that are floating around in monkeys, okay, what we can in fact trace is all the different genetic relationships between all of these viruses that are found in different species. For example, this is mandrel, uh, this is a green African green monkey, uh, and uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, a strain of monkey called Sykes. And in fact, what we unambiguously can link is the fingerprint between HIV-1 and the simian immune deficiency virus that is in chimpanzee, which is CPZ, okay? So the original guesswork suggesting that it probably came from bushmeat is in fact indelibly confirmed by these genetic fingerprints. So that just simply illustrates to you how a new disease develops and sort of the very um, basic uh, couple of stories of the, the discovery by uh, several very uh, excellent virology groups and isolating the virus. And that, of course, was from the early 1980s. So you dial the hand of the clock forward and you come to present day. And I guess what most people are interested in is, well, how big is the problem now? Well, the problem is not small. Uh, it is not as big as hepatitis. Hepatitis virus, whether you talk about HBV or HCV, they are globally in the hundreds of millions. HIV is not quite there. HIV is sort of steadily maintaining a plateau of around 30 some million. Okay. And these, this number, unfortunately for us, this number is not really increasing rapidly, it seems to have steadily uh, reached a, a sort of an equilibrium uh, plateau. So if you look in, in the US, we have about a million individuals infected. By far the biggest problem is in sub-Saharan Africa. There's also a substantial problem in South Asia, uh, in Indian subcontinent, uh, which has a, also a very large uh, 
the disease burden. And of course, in China, the estimate is about uh, sort of 800,000 or so, but most of us believe that that's probably an, an underestimation. Now, if you look at the number, 34 million, that prevalence in itself should not necessarily be that scary. Because I would argue to you that the other virus that I work on, which is also a human retrovirus called human T-cell leukemia virus, that virus infects 20 million people worldwide. And I would, I would bet that probably none of you have heard about that virus and the disease that it causes, which is adult T-cell leukemia. And the reason is because HIV is 30 million, okay? But HIV has a pretty high uh, incidence rate and a pretty high mortality rate, okay? So when you have 33 million people or 34 million people infected and you have a couple of million of them dying every year, okay, that is something that you have to take notice. In the case of HTLV1, for example, affects 20 million people, but a handful of people come down with adult T cell leukemia, okay? The penetrance of the disease takes about 30 to 40 years of latency and then about one to 2% after 30 to 40 years of infection do those individuals come down with leukemia. So that is quite a big difference in terms of a high prevalence or comparable prevalence, in this case, a really pretty significant mortality rate, okay? Whereas that also high prevalent disease is rather steady, it goes through a long latency and doesn't really end up killing a lot of people. <clears throat> but the real number that you can sort of wrap your finger around is that every single day, every 24 hours, we are experiencing 7,000 new individuals being infected. And I think I heard Tony uh, Fauci talk about this uh, at one point, which he said that for every one that we, we, every newly infected individual, only one out of six would get access to drug treatment. So suggesting then that we are leaving a very, very large number of newly infected individuals who would never get the benefit of drug treatment. And of course, if you don't get the benefit of drug treatment, then all bets are off, okay? Then the disease becomes rather uh, brutal and, and the outcome is uh, very poor. <coughs> so some of you, especially the younger ones in this room, are probably wondering about, well, how do I get infected with HIV? Well, we heard about intravenous drug use, would certainly expose you to that. But most people are probably just thinking about, well, I go out on a date and I, you know, at the end of the evening, I find my partner to be rather attractive. And if I were so bold as to have unprotected sex, okay, which is a bad idea, uh, I have uh, children of that age. Uh, and so I worry about, you know, people thinking about having unprotected uh, sexual um, encounters. Uh, so the one sort of silver lining with unprotected sex is that it's not 100% damning, okay? Uh, interestingly, the statistics are that it is really only one out of every hundred times. Even if the partner is HIV positive, okay? The statistics, and, but I, I mean, I don't want you to play Russian roulette with that kind of statistics. And I don't want you to say, hey, you know, I heard this guy lecture and he says, 99 times I can have sex with someone who's HIV positive and I'm gonna be good, okay? I don't want you to take that, okay? I just wanna say that statistically, mathematically, the number seems to be one out of a hundred. Okay, and there, you know, God is not fair. God is a sexist, okay? It turns out to be that if the male is HIV positive, the female is more likely to be infected by the man. Whereas if the female is HIV positive, the encounter rate, you know, of successful transmission actually goes down, okay? So, so it's not equal. It's not like, well, if, if my girlfriend is HIV positive, the chances that she would get it from me if, if she were not HIV positive is the same, and then vice versa, okay? 
So the receptive partner is always at higher risk than the transmissive partner. Okay. Um, and the way that you receive that sexual encounter also matters. So if you do the straight vaginal transmission encounter, the chances are much lower. If you do the anal encounter, okay, then the chances of transmission is probably you do it once and you're going to come down with HIV. Okay? So it goes up to a rate of approximately 1 as opposed to a rate of approximately 0 0.1. Okay? So these are just some of the things that I know that whenever I talk to people, people are always interested in, in asking. Of course, you know, the um, maternal transmission, you can also get mother to child transmission, and that is also a risk factor. But today it gets much better now because we have lots of drugs that if we treat the mother with, the transmission to the child is much lower. Um, healthcare workers, very low rate. Um, postdocs who come into my lab uh, frequently, uh, when they've never worked with viruses before, are scared to death of working with HIV. Okay, <clears throat> and what I can say is that uh, the medical, the healthcare worker rate of transmission, okay, is healthcare workers. It's like real doctors, okay, as opposed to sort of pseudo doctors like me who only work in the lab. Our transmission rate in terms of working with laboratory HIV is essentially zero. Okay. I know historically at NIH there were three documented cases with individuals who were in uh, Bob Gallo's lab who were infected, but they were working sort of at a large scale production level. In terms of my 25 years of working with HIV experience, I know no single laboratory worker who is doing sort of analytical studies who have ever been transmitted with HIV. So it's extremely safe in, in that regard because I think we take very good precautions and our laboratory techniques are, are really pretty good. So if you look at the molecular level, uh, this is what the virus really looks like under electron microscopy. This is sort of a artist's uh, uh, idealized version. Looks sort of beautiful, but uh, don't be fooled by its beauty because this is a rather dangerous virus has uh, two copies of RNA genome wrapped in a sort of a, uh, a ovoid type uh, capsule, almost sort of like a missile. And this is a shell with these uh, proteins that are sort of like anchors that attach onto the cell. And then this thing gets injected. So a way to look at that would be like this, OK? So, so here's like the bomb, and here's like the homing target. It binds onto receptors on the cell. And the receptors are C is called the CD4 molecule. And it could have an ancillary receptor that's called a co-receptor that sort of determine the different kinds of cells that are infected. So like Wynn alluded to, HIV can infect macrophages, or HIV can infect T lymphocytes. Okay? And how HIV decides and which kind of HIV decides to infect macrophages versus T lymphocytes depends on a co-receptor because both of them would have a CD4 receptor. So the viral envelope comes, okay, the receptor, okay, the envelope protein meets the receptor, opens up this bubble, injects in this bullet shell, and then the genome goes into the cell. And here again, is the illustration that there are two kinds of HIV. There is a kind that infects macrophages, and there's a kind that infects T cells. The only difference between them is their envelopes are slightly different. Okay? And having a slightly different envelope determines whether they can use a co-receptor called CXCR4 or a co-receptor called CCR5. Okay? Um, at one point, we thought that the, CCR, uh, the CXCR4 virus was sort of more virulent, and the CCR5 virus was sort of the early version. The, uh, the macrophage versions are, was always thought of as being the initial cells that are being infected, and sort of the early encounter in the mucosa. 
but it turns out that this form can evolve quickly into this form. Okay? So both forms eventually in the end come out to be equally bad. So you don't get any benefit if you say, well, I was initially infected only with a CCR virus, CCR5 virus and you, know, you were infected with a CXCR4 virus. Okay? In the end, uh, this virus can become this virus and they can <coughs> all the different kinds of HIVs can cause the same kind of bad outcome in terms of disease. This is just to tell you that once after the virus infects, the virus uh, RNA is made into DNA, and the DNA is taken into your nucleus. That's where all your chromosomes are. And the virus then integrates into your chromosome. So it really becomes a part of you. It's like a new gene. It's like gene therapy, where you have gained basically a piece of virus in you. And once it integrates there, okay, it's there forever. And that is the reason why HIV is so difficult to eradicate. Because the whole idea is that the only way you can eradicate the virus is because it's integrated in you. It becomes now part of you. Okay? And the only way that you can eradicate a virus is that you kill your own cells. Right? That's like what a lot of oncologists used to, I mean, you know, when I was uh, in the hospital uh, as a young house officer, you know, one of the uh, oncologists used to brag to me, he says, you know, we can have a 100% cure rate of all cancers. We eventually cure them all. And I said, how could you do that? Well, he says, because the patients die. So of course the cancers are killed then. So, so this is the same problem with HIV because once it integrates, it becomes part of you. And the only way you're going to be able to rid it is that if you're going to kill a great abundance of your infected cells. Okay? And that's like you know, killing the patient okay, in order to solve the disease. And that's not a very good, uh, that's not a very good uh, exchange. Um, so, so the virus goes in, it integrates. Um, then the integrated copy of the virus is called a provirus. It makes uh, messenger RNAs, which is made uh, into a viral proteins. And these viral proteins are assembled. And the assembly of the viral proteins allow it to make new particles, and new particles butt out, and you end up going through a new round of infection. Okay? So that really is as simple as it gets in terms of the virus life cycle. The only difference between HIV and other viruses, all viruses end up infecting cells. The difference between HIV, because it's a retrovirus, and other viruses is because HIV integrates into you and it becomes a part of your chromosome. Okay? And that creates a substantial obstacle to the concept of cure and eradication. Okay, so that's at the cell level. What about at the whole body level? At the whole body level, it's really that virus infects you. Okay, so I showed you the picture of what happens when the cell gets infected by the virus. But what happens when you get infected by a virus? When you get infected by a virus, there is a period within the first three to six weeks after you are infected that you have a big peak of viremia. Okay? That's when you come down with a flu-like syndrome. You have fever, you have chills, you, know, you have adenopathy, you have sore throat, you basically feel bad. Okay? And then the body is able to take care of the virus okay? and the viral load comes down just naturally without having to take any drugs. Okay? And then that's maintained really pretty steadily for years, up to almost a decade. Okay? And at the same time, this blue graph shows you what happens to your T cells, which are the cells that end up <coughs> defending you against other, other infections. Okay? So these are the white blood cells okay, that normally clears pathogens out of your body. Okay? They are killed by the virus. And at some point, because so many of your T cells are killed by viruses, that you end up having an immune deficient state and you end up having opportunistic infections. And if un left untreated, okay, that is generally followed by death. Uh, these are just some pictures to show you that the problem with viral infection is 
that at the end of the day, all of this I'm going to tell you we can treat. It's this latent infection and some of these chronic infection that hides in different tissue reservoirs that we are not going to be able to have drugs that reach them. So we can suppress them, but we cannot eliminate them. Okay? And those are sort of the $64 million question that is challenging the field right now, which is that we can keep viruses under control. We can get rid of 99.99%, okay? but that 0.001% will be there forever. And if you stop taking drugs, you stop taking the antiretroviral drugs, that reservoir will pop out. And so the concept now that we have to use is that drug treatment has to be lifelong because we can't get rid of the latent reservoir. OK, so in the early days, you, are, you would have really two pictures if you were infected by HIV. You will, you will I would say 99.5% of individuals would be progressors. Left untreated, your CD4 cell com, comes down, and at some point you become infected uh, with opportunistic infections, and you succumb to disease and you die. And then there is a very fortunate, I would say, 0.05% or perhaps less of individuals who are long-term survivors, long-term non-progressors, naturally, okay, without drug treatment. Okay? But most people would suffer this, and a very small number of people would be blessed by God and be able to basically withstand virus infection on a natural level. We know some of those people because uh, we have uh, 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 characterize a group of people who have uh, a deletion in co-receptors called CCR5 deletion, delta-32. And those people are the explanation for some of the long-term survivor uh, non-progressives. But the good news is that today I would say it's really the opposite, which is that most people will show up as this phenotype, and very few people, if they are treated, will have the progressive phenotype. Because we really have great drugs for treating HIV. These are really, really great drugs. We have protease inhibitors, we have RT inhibitors, they're either the nucleoside, nucleotide form, or the non-nucleoside, non-nucleotide form. We have entry inhibitors, uh, we have uh, integrase inhibitors, and this is only uh, not completely up-to-date list. Uh, this is a, the list about uh, from three years ago. Uh, today you will have even more number of integrase inhibitors, you will have uh, uh, better fusion inhibitors and so on. And in fact, the drug combinations are, are, are really pretty good that we are now down to you know, single pill. Uh, back in the early days of treatment, people used to walk around with an entire cup of pills that they have to take every day. Now you can get down to just basically taking one pill a day and, and, and that would do very, very well in terms of treating your disease. All of these drugs work very well. This is what they look like if you have a virus in the tissue culture, and you treated the virus uh, with these drugs, you find that uh, all the replication of the virus ends up going down and become very well suppressed by a drug. Um, we are improving. Statistics show that we're doing better. Uh, so for example, 45% of patients had uh, sustained viral suppression in 2001, and this is a study that was uh, published in JAMA uh, just last year. Uh, now the statistics are much better. 72% of uh, HIV-infected uh, individuals in 2010, uh, because this is a uh, looking back retrospectively, uh, have. Uh, so you can see that's a 30% increase uh, within uh, nine years. Uh, so that's showing you that uh, not only do the drugs work, but also the extent of treatment is, is really getting much broader. Um, in fact, um, the commonly quoted number is that if you put somebody on treatment, you can easily gain an extra 24 years reliably. Okay? So, so one could almost argue that if you are a 55-year-old, and your life, natural life expectancy is not more than 25 years, right? So 55-year-olds who are infected with HIV can essentially say 
that they're cured once they get on drug treatment because that's not going to change their natural course of their lifespan. Right? But we have to worry about the younger folks, okay? Because there are, you know, babies who get HIV from maternal to uh, fetal transmission, and uh, there are also young people who get infected. But anyway, that's just to say that, you know, a rule of thumb is that, you know, modern drug treatment is very good, uh, and this is just sort of an average number, and of course there are people who are doing much, much better, uh, and you can see uh, Ms. Brown's probably an example, and uh, the more famous poster child would be Magic Johnson, right? I mean, clearly, when you see him on television, not only does he look healthy, but when you see him, every time I see him, he looks like he's gaining weight. That tells you that the, the drugs must be doing really well, because uh, <coughs> for people to be infected with HIV and still gaining weight, that's a, that's a really a good sign the treatment is working well. Now, treatment does have a cost. And treatment is faced with the reality that it doesn't reach everybody because it is expensive. And if you sit down and you do the calculation uh, in terms of the cost, then you quickly realize that it's impossible that we can treat everybody, right? Because think about it. So this was an estimate that was uh, published in 2011, suggesting that the lifelong cost of HIV treatment based on 2009 dollars and this is based on a treatment in the United States, is around, let's say, 300000 Okay, And the total cost then to American HIV-infected individuals, right, for lifelong treatment of a million or so would be $450 billion, Okay, over a lifetime. So if you think the American number is 1 million, the global number is 33 million, so you multiply this by 30, let's say, so you multiply this by 10, that becomes 4,500 billion, right? That's 4 trillion, right? So that's if you treat 10 million people, okay, lifelong. Now 30 million people, okay, that would be 12 trillion, right? 12 trillion is like our national debt, right? So how many people, how many countries around the world, how are we going to get the world to pony up Twelve trillion dollars to treat everybody for lifelong. Okay, that's probably not realistic, and so we have to come up with better solutions. Uh, we are treating more and more people, so this is showing that the number of people that, at the end of 2010, uh, in areas like North Africa, Europe, East uh, and Southeast Asia. So uh, this is not Western Europe, not not North America. This is like the rest of the world, and so number of people getting access to drug treatment is uh, increasing. That shows that we're doing really good things, okay? But the question is, this is still a snapshot, okay? Because as I just alluded to you, once you get on treatment, it has to be lifelong, okay? Anytime you stop treatment, that reservoir is going to come back, okay? And the person is basically going to be faced with a potential, you know, death sentence again, okay? So, so this is a good thing, but the question is that can we increase it? And not only increase it, but can we do the increase in a sustainable, lifelong fashion? I think that's a challenge. I think nobody has sat down and calculated the economics for that. Okay, so if that's where we are today, okay, and we can't see that as a solution, because it's not a solution, because the money simply can't, the amount of money available simply can't do it. So, what, what is the potential solution in the future? Well, the potential solution in the future, I think, can only come if we use an immunological-based approach, which is that I said to you that HIV is probably the best virus that we have done in terms of studying it and treating it. Of course, the better viruses are the ones that we've cured by using vaccines. Okay? So if you think about vaccination, then you need to think about innate immunity that we might have. I'll talk about that in a couple slides. And also adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity is what we can elicit by using vaccines. Innate immunity are the factors that we already have inside our body that if we understand how they react against viruses and harness them, maybe we can do better, okay? So if you're gonna make a vaccine, you can think about, uh, for your purposes, just think about there's two different kind of immunological response. 
cytotoxic T cell response or antibody response. So presumably what we can do is make vaccines that elicit antibodies and vaccines that elicit cytotoxic T cell responses. And if we can do both, then I think we're going to do better. Okay? The progress being made because uh, there are uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies that we're isolating now and that people are making progress in terms of generating them against HIV. And, uh, and we have identified some of them. And uh, the whole idea now is to simply see if we can uh, design the right immunogens so that when we put those immunogens into uh, individuals, that they can elicit these broadly cross-neutralizing antibodies that cover all sorts of different strains. There are problems, <coughs> there are potential issues that uh, hinder our ability to generate broadly neutralizing antibodies. That's because HIV has a lot of sequence diversity, like the flu. Lots and lots of different HIV change all the time. So if you generate antibody against one sequence, the virus quickly escapes and makes other sequences. And then that particular vaccine is not going to work. And the problem also is the problem of latency. So if you keep the virus under suppress with one antibody, it goes into latency and over time evolves into a different sequence, then of course you're not going to be able to address that. The other thing is that uh, we can go back to the biology of mammalian cells and try to understand if there are any innate factors that, that nature is trying to teach us about how to prevent HIV from replicating in cells or from killing cells. Uh, so it's very interesting that HIV, of course, replicates and kills human cells very well. But if you look at other mammals like rabbits or rats or mouse and uh, uh, different kinds of mammalian hosts, HIV actually does very poorly in many of these different species. Okay? So suggesting there are factors that are lost or factors that are gained in some of these species that prevent HIV from replicating in them. And if we can understand what these factors are, then we can obviously uh, increase the inhibitory factors or decrease the factors that make us more susceptible to HIV infection. And that would be another natural way that we can do to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, defeat the virus. And so a lot of work has gone into studying factors that restrict HIV. And this is just a slide to illustrate some of them. It's not important what they are named as, but just simply for you to know, there are a lot of different human factors that exist within your cell that do pretty decent jobs of trying to restrict the virus from replicating. Okay? They are obviously not able to do it sufficiently well because without drug treatment, you can still come down with HIV. But the fact that there is a long period in which you can sustain your health without being uh, adversely harmed by HIV suggests that some of these factors, if we can increase the efficiency, would in fact help you and do well to protect you. And if you're interested, you can go to this journal that uh, Wynn had alluded to. It's an open access journal, so you don't need any subscription. And you can read a lot about uh, different restriction factors and so on, and all sorts of different uh, interesting studies that are published uh, on, on HIV. And this was a, a review that I wrote recently, co-wrote co with a couple of colleagues on looking at uh, human host restriction factors in HIV infection and many different promising factors that we should uh, focus attention to. I just want to close by giving an acknowledgement. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge Malcolm Martin. Because uh, when Wynn contacted me and said, I have to give this scientific American-like uh, lecture uh, to the audience, I said, holy cow, I don't have those kind of slides. I mean, ah, you know, I have real research slides. But Wynn said, no, 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 those won't do. Okay? It's not like you're giving sort of a pathology lecture to medical students. Here is a lay audience and, and so on. So, so I went to Malcolm, and, and Malcolm gave me a bunch of his. So, so many of the slides that you saw are actually stolen from Malcolm's slide collection. Okay? And so Malcolm, of course, uh, and I have worked together now for the last 25 years. His lab is down the hall from mine. And, and uh, so, so I've learned a lot from him. And then I also want to acknowledge that these are 25 or so postdocs that have worked for the last two decades with me on HIV. I have 25 other postdocs that work on HTLV1, but I didn't list their name. But anyway, thank you very much for this opportunity to tell you about HIV.
Thank you very much. That was fantastic. <laughs> so, please, I hope you have some questions. <laughs> Speak up loudly, because there are yes, a lot of people who are online. Uh. So do you think that the drugs which are used uh, for treatment, they are inducing the silencing of the integrated DNA of HIV? Uh, so that, uh, once the drugs are out, that they are expressing more and... So, so we know the mechanism of drugs. So the drugs that are protease inhibitors, they prevent HIV from generating the correct viral proteins so you cannot assemble viral particles. The drugs that are reverse transcription inhibitors, they prevent reverse transcription so you cannot make the genome copy, so you cannot make the provirus. Okay. So we know exactly what each of the drugs are doing. Okay. So the drugs can only protect the cell or can only uh, sort of abrogate the virus if it is indeed a productive replication. A silent replication, meaning that the virus just sits there and say, I'm not going to do anything. Okay, I'm not going to use my reverse transcriptase. I'm not going to use my protease. I'm not going to do anything. Then, of course, the drugs can't touch the virus. Okay. Uh, looking into the future some more, what, what is your bet on a vaccine developing in the next decade? So I, I think it's a very difficult question because, uh, because um, one has to really balance it with the concept that um, how effective do we really need the vaccine to be? Because we already do have very effective drugs. So is it going to be a combination of uh, both? Uh, and uh, you know that the flu vaccine is not 100%, but we use the flu vaccine. Uh, so is something that is a 50 to 70 percent effective vaccine, is that good enough? And is it going to be uh, an approach in which we have to uh, regularly change that cocktail and to protect against the most uh, you know, prominent uh, virus? And then how often do we need to repeatedly uh, immunize uh, individuals, vaccinate people against HIV. These are all very difficult questions to answer, and 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 I have to confess to you that uh, I don't know the answers. I mean, there are a lot of other people who who know uh, uh, that better than I do. Uh, I know what the problems are, uh, but I don't know that uh, that we have a. I think we're far from. So the universal vaccine that we can just give to people and that can protect against all viruses uh, all the time. Um, Thank you. So I just wanted to ask you about the latency pools. Uh -huh. um, so if the cell, uh, if the virus has integrated within the genome and the cell isn't dividing, then once the cell dies, then the source of virus is gone. So for this latency pool to maintain, the cells have to be dividing, even if it's not for an active viral infection. So how is that maintained? What is the nature of the cells where the latent infection is? Well, so the surprising thing is that they are, we have a lot of very long-lived quiescent cells in our body. And once a cell goes into quiescence, it can survive for a very long time. Uh, so, so, um, so the, so, so the reason that we know that it's a cell that ha has gone into quiescence and hasn't replicated and the virus hasn't replicated is because you know, studies have been done in which a person uh, who has been infected with HIV, okay, and uh, you manage to uh, sequence his virus, and then 20 years later, you go and, and take a reservoir population from his bone marrow, for example, and then you sequence the virus in there, what you find is that the virus 20 years later, the, the, proviral, the proviral genome is exactly the same as 20 years ago. So suggesting that, that that virus has laid dormant, has not replicated at all in 20 years, because we know that as, as soon as the virus starts replicating, that genome is going to start changing. So, so the change in the genome is like a carbon dating biological clock tells you that the virus is replicating and, and how often the virus has replicated. So if you can go and see, okay, 
you know, a virus that was isolated 20 years ago from one person, and then if you go and get a reservoir tissue from him and find exactly the same sequence, okay, in living cells from his bone marrow or from his, uh, you know, lymph node or whatever, that tells you that that cell was infected 20 years ago, okay, and that virus was there 20 years ago and hasn't done a thing. So those kind of evidence tells us that latent, quiescent, long-lived cells, okay, apparently exist and they are going to be a problem for us. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a question with your drug designing strategy for the future. That means you are stressing more on the host factor based drugs. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not necessarily stressing the host factor based drugs. I'm, I'm just uh, arguing that there are mechanisms and proteins that we have inside our body that are there to defend against uh, viral infections. Uh, so interferon, for example, is, is a host factor. Okay, yeah. it's, not, it's not just that we inject patients with interferon. Your body actually makes interferon to, to dispel the virus for you uh, when you're infected with any number of viruses. Okay? So, if we, so, so, so the reason that we learn to use interferon to treat viruses is because we learned a long time ago by studying individuals who were infected with virus, we saw that they mounted interferon responses. So we said, ah, if we in fact make more of in interferon and inject them into patients, could we use that for treatment? So today, one of the ways to treat HIV infection is to use these broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that we've been able to isolate from HIV infected individuals. Uh, the, the antibodies in natural infection tells us they, they work. If we can make enough of them and inject them into patients, it's essentially like treating patients in the same concept as injecting them with interferon. The only problem is that, you know, purifying these monoclonal antibodies and making them in that kind of concentration is extremely expensive. So the lifetime treatment of using broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies that we can purify and that we have observed being made in some patients, that is just cost prohibitive, even more than so the 12 trillion number that, uh, that perhaps we need for drug treatment. So, you know, there's a lot of good science and there's a lot of theoretical way. And, and there's gene therapy. There are, you know, one or two instances, examples of individuals who have undergone bone marrow transplant, okay, and, and, and have become cured of HIV. Okay, so, so the science is there, you know, in theory for eradication of a cure. But the cost, uh, you know, of, you know, everybody going through a bone marrow transplant to be cured of HIV is just not realistic. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I wonder if you could go back to that slide uh -huh. on the probability of transmission uh -huh. from various uh, <sighs> acts. Yeah. Okay, I, I think they were just basically. Uh, uh, Okay, so, but up there you say, you say that this is percentage, so that 1.0 is, is only 1%. Oh, 1%, I, I, yeah, I, I, Okay, because I. 1%, not 100%, okay. sorry. Okay. Yeah, you're right. The, and, the point one, point zero 0.01 is even smaller than 1%, right. yeah. 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 Uh, the other question I had, I guess this, you know, is for both of you, um, are these, are, HIV drugs and HCV drugs, do they both just uh, stop replication or uh, they don't actually kill uh, cells? Is that right? Well, the HIV drugs, they don't kill cells. Right. They just stop the replication. They kill the virus. They don't kill the cells. Right. I mean, and is that the same with HCV? They just, okay. So are there people who are resistant to HIV? Why are people resistant to HIV? Well, you know, uh, so, you, so, so, so there's, there are a group of people who have this polymorphism in their CCR5 receptor. Uh, so, so they have a form of this protein, uh, natural form of this protein, uh, that HIV has to use in order to enter the cell. And, 
And their natural form is a form that is not usable by the virus. So the virus can't enter the cell. So these guys can, can, can be exposed to the virus, uh, the CCR5 form of the virus, okay, and completely be uninfected. Now, why, why do those things happen? Uh, I, I guess it's similar to, to the concept of uh, why do we have you know, sickle cell anemia uh, and, and, uh, and certain, you know, uh, certain you know, hemoglobin uh, polymorphisms? Because, I mean, at least when I was in medical school, I was taught that they were selected for in Africa to protect against malaria infection. And, and therefore, those traits and, and, and those things have a slightly beneficial advantage, and therefore they became preserved in the gene pool. So I would argue that ancestrally, people thought that that change probably protected against you know, other pathogens or something, and, or gave those particular individuals a beneficial advantage. And so that particular polymorphism then became uh, ingrained and became preserved in that population. Yeah, so that's one example of a natural protection against HIV. Yeah, as a blood bank, I just want to point out that although historically the risk of, if you got a positive unit, you had a 90% chance of being infected, but your chance of getting a positive unit now is about one in two million. <laughs> and, and then the amount of virus in that one in two million is very early in the infection and might be lower, so you wouldn't even have the 90% chance. This is a slide that I took from Malcolm Martin. So I actually mm. don't know how old this slide is, okay? And he's been around much longer than I have, so, <laughs> so it could be a much older slide. Now, the slide is correct, that if you do get a positive unit, you had a 90% chance of, of becoming infected. It's just that your chance of getting a positive unit now has small. changed dramatically. Yeah. yeah. Mm. In this country, it's very small. Other countries are still... Yeah, most of Europe, uh, but not so much in Africa. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is the virus lethal in the um, primate original? Uh, well, yeah. Very good question. So, uh, many of the SIVs are not pathogenic in their natural host. And, 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 this is, and, and this is actually something that we learned a long time ago, uh, which is that, for, for example, um, you and I are infected with herpes simplex, type 1 at least. <laughs> and all it does is it causes cold okay? Um, and, and so we're the natural host for herpes simplex virus, okay? Now, herpes simplex virus version in monkeys is called herpes B. Okay, herpes B virus is basically causing cold sores when they infect monkeys. Now, at least when I was in graduate school and I studied herpes virus and did my thesis on herpes virus, okay, at least back then, there were something like 22 reported cases of human beings infected with herpes B. Now, of course, you know, 25 years later, number of cases I'm sure is larger. But back then, the statistics were, okay, that out of 20-some cases of humans infected with monkey herpes simplex virus, the monkey cold sore virus, fatality was something like 19 out of 22. So a relatively innocuous virus in one species, once it jumps into another species, becomes a very pathogenic and very lethal virus. And that rule seems to hold with many different kinds of viruses, not just uh, HIV uh, and SIV. SIV in the natural SIV host is um, so, so uh, w one could argue that if we could, you, you could change me into a monkey, I would be resistant to HIV. <laughs> but that's not, that's not very powerful though for me. I would prefer to stay the way I am. <laughs> yeah. Is it possible to modify the receptor in the human cells then in yes. the system that uh, HIV infection? Yes, yes. And that's part of the gene therapy approach that some people have thought about. Okay. One last question. Is uh -huh. there any uh, impact of geographical condition on HIV reproduction? Because if you will see the world map of uh, where you are showing 34.1 uh, mil billion or million of patients, uh, I mean candidates, then it's showing that uh, 
it, within the equator region, the maximum number of uh, uh, figure is going on around 4.3 or something like that, if you are going in a world map. Yeah, so yeah, is there any geographical impact on the HIV virus reproduction? Uh, well, I don't think it's geographical effect. I think it's much more of uh, sort of founder effects and, uh, you know, prevalence of individuals and, and sort of uncontrollable sp spread. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, no, I, I, I think there's no, I mean, there, there may be social, economic, and, you know, other cultural effects that promote HIV spreading. I, I don't think that it's, you know, it's a temperature thing or it's a tropical thing that, that, that somehow, because, you know, the temperature is warmer and it's more tropical region, and therefore there's more HIV. Um, no, I don't think that's, yeah. Okay, well, listen, I, we all want to thank you both very, very much. This is most instructive. Thank you. That was great. That was